Jerry, o over to you, thanks, because you're a, a solder man. I am, yeah, but um, I'll, hmm. I'll get the screen share up. Laurie called me a few days ago. Done. I've only got a dozen pictures up. A couple of re well, A, I didn't have time to put much more together, but also I thought Mick and Laurie, between them, their point construction methods uh, are much more um, technical than mine. I'm very much old school. Uh, and, and although I'll mention the sort of um, soldered point work I do, I won't go into gr any great detail on how I do it because it's, it's, it's no different. There's nothing radical in, in what I do. It's, it's quite simplistic. I'm very much old school, and that's not to say that the methods I use are any better than any of the others. It's simply, A, I don't really understand technical stuff and things like Templot and, and the computer-aided design stuff. But it's also the way I've always done it. And being a bit of a, a, an old fart in that sort of way, um, I, it, it's worked for me and I just continue to do it. So I, I do use soldered point work with chair plates. I've built a couple of the um, plastic ones. I've built one of the pegged ones, um, which I've got on a little board, which I take out to demos, exhibitions, if anybody can remember those. <laughs> and it, lo it looks fantastic. And I, I continue with the soldered one simply because that's what I've always done. I've got plenty of materials. Um, anybody that comes along to see me at uh, demonstrations or at shows and asks what's the best way, and, and my advice is always have a go at a pegged kit have a go at a soldered one and see which one you get on with. And the one you're happiest with and gives you the reliable results that you're after is the best way for you. Um, but I think whether you choose plastic or PCB is very much a personal choice. Uh, they, they both have their, their great merits. So I'm not going to talk a great deal about how I build track. I'm just going to sort of run you through a few pictures of the way I sort of set things out and lay things and so on. And I often rather jokingly say to, you know, say to people that my end plot essentially involves rolls of wallpaper and a bendy stick. And people sort of chuckle away, but that's, that's pretty much what it is. Uh, you can see here, this, this is taken a couple of years ago. Well, you can see it's a few years ago because it's in my workshop. Over on the back right uh, of that picture is, is a very embryonic sucking mill. And up to the left on a slightly higher level is the station area of Bath. But on that big lump of ply, uh, you'll see it's a bit of wallpaper. It's a bit of lining paper laid out, which I've drawn out the, the central board for Bath station area. It's the engine shed and goods yard uh, area. It's six foot six long. And it's, it's that uh, great planning technique of draw the whole thing out on wallpaper and then lay it out on the piece of ply, draw around it, and then cut your baseboard to fit your track plan, which is obviously the, op the opposite way around than most people would do it, but uh, there it is. But that's drawn out essentially, I don't know, can I make that, there you go. You can see how that's drawn out. That's drawn out essentially with a whole load of point templates, photocopied point templates, and a pencil and a ruler, and my bendy stick, and you'll see my bendy stick in a bit. It's, it's basically, it's a piece of doorstop, just normal pine doorstop. Uh, doorstop is nine mil thick nominally, which when you draw a pencil line down either side, gives you about nine and a half mil, which is absolutely perfect for us. And if you can find a knot free piece, it bends uh, very nicely to give you some nice, nice flowing curves. So all the point work and the slip work and everything on there is from regular templates and um, CNL, uh, which gives you a whole host of common uh, crossings and switch lengths and so on. And I, I cut and shut them with a pair of scissors. If I want a slightly curved point, I cut lots of little slits in it and bend it. I mean, you can now, of course, it's much more straightforward now to do all that with Templot. And I know Laurie's just done completed a, a, an amazing, I think it's become a bit of an epic course on uh, Templot, which I believe is is being edited and, and is going to be added to the um, two mil site. So I shall, I shall watch that at some point. But me and computers don't get on very well. So I've, I've stuck with my old bendy stick and template <laughs> method. So it's, um, I'm very much old school. So that's the, that's the yard at Bath. The other method I use is actually an Ian Rice trick from one of his, I think it's from his track building book years ago. This picture shows the, um, the rebuilding of Highbury Colliery into what's now Foxcut Colliery. And the, the track work that's a bit ballasted and scenic down the middle is the original track work. 
and the Pico stuff, the Pico flexible stuff in front, is me basically laying out a potential new track work. And Ian did this in one of his books years ago. He just got, you know, for one of his P4 layouts, he just got a load of Pico streamline a flexi track and he just bent it and laid it around to see what worked visually you know you can you can draw and plan something out um on paper which you think is going to work but until you lay it out on a board i find anyway that uh, it's very difficult to really visualize how it's going to look um but that's broadly what i ended up building that crossover i uh, can't make a mouse work on here uh, but that crossover up there by the signal box is actually much further down this end but basically that's what i ended up that's what I ended up doing. So again, it's it's a very old school method. It's done with you know bits of flexi track and moving things around until I'm happy, and then I just mark it all out. Uh, this is my bendy stick, and here it is. You can you can see it. There's just a load of panel pins pinned into the board, and the stick is bent to give me those those nice sweeping curves. This is down one side of the room uh, in with a workshop. It's the opposite side of the room to Bath. A 20 foot run and it represents the the sort of run from uh, the end of coombe Dane tunnel to the collieries um around radstock and one of the main features of that length on the prototype on the somerset and dorset was there wasn't really a straight stretch of, of track anywhere on that stretch of the line uh, mainly because the line was laid on the largely where they could on the towpath of the old somerset coal canal uh, for cheapness sake essentially so the line uh, it curves backwards and forth forwards very attractively actually really following the, the outline of the hills so i wanted to represent that so you know my bendy stick here does that really nicely and you can see it's just it's just some panel pins and the stick is bent to give me those nice sweeping curves we are, and all i do is um just run a pencil down either side of it and that's it um, again, very, very straightforward old school techniques. A uh, couple of pictures of how I build the point work. I, I use uh, PCB sleepers with chair plates. Uh, I've got a whole load of little chair plates that the association made years ago. Although before that, I just used to use strips of uh, brass. A, a lot of it was etch waste around the point work that I just cut up with a little pair of uh, side cutters, which was a bit tedious, but, you know, fairly straightforward. And it's it's a, a lump of old Formica white shaft that you can see has been used numerous times because it's filthy with PCB stuck down to double sided tape over the drawing. And the drawings again are just done uh, with a pen and a ruler and uh, bendy sticks. And you can see these are actually for the um, the, the yard entrance. Uh, sorry, not the yard entrance, the station throat on Bath. This bottom one here is right opposite the main bar signal box with the line going into the north platform there. And this top one, I can't remember exactly where this one's from. Yeah, down main from the south platform. There you are. That's those crossovers there. You can see I've left the gaps where the uh, where the tie bars are going to go. And um, I'm not, I haven't got any pictures of the tie bars that I have for a, a future date if anybody's interested. But I think I've shown them before. They're broadly the same as the ones that the association have developed now. Although, as I said earlier, I, I use an actual moving sleeper and I use a bit of fiberglass cut to the same size as a sleeper um, with a hole up through the middle. But it's broadly the same as the ones. And it, it's, it works very well. It's a, system, it's a system that works well. I also use an easy track to get the gauge and to hold the rail before you start soldering. And you can see that that here and i think the next one shows it even better you can see there uh, you know there's there's my length of easy track uh, and if i blow that up you can see just little little chair plates put under and i rely on a little blob of solder to represent the chair it's an awful lot quicker than either plastic or the methods that laurie or bob use and it's very strong but visually it's not as good you know it's it it's another one of those things you know there is no right or wrong way uh, you do what you know you're 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 happy with and what serves the purpose you're after and i'm not patient enough to um go to the sort of lengths that laurie does <laughs> uh, but visually it, it's good enough for me but i'll be the first to admit when you get really close up photography it doesn't look as good as when you've got those really nice cast chairs all those little etched 
fold up chairs but uh, and it's it's very old school really but for me once it's painted and ballasted i'm i'm quite happy with the way it looks i came across this picture this is on the um this is actually where the track goes to to double track on the um lincoln vale section of the layout and it, it essentially just shows how i connect electrical connections not as neat as mixed pins but it's, it's essentially the same thing i've got easy track there you can see both ends and there's pcb sleepers and the rail is soldered onto those and then down through holes and when that's dropped down that's all but invisible the pile of weights behind are for, for weighting the track down once i glue it down and just for those who are interested it's one mil ply that i use as a track base this is track being laid on the extension for the colliery. Um, and again, you can see there's a whole series of, of weights holding everything down. And you've got that combination of easy track for the plane track, which is it's just fantastic stuff. I mean, God bless Mick and the, the consortium that did this. Uh, Bath, Bath is a big layout. I mean, it's not big on the same scale as, as fence houses, but it's still by two mil standards, a big layout. And being able to lay the plain track with with the plastic track, which which is comparatively so quick to do compared with the old soldered stuff, and it looks fantastic. It really does give you good looking track. It's an absolute boon. Uh, you can see there where that little weight is there. That that section there of uh, PCB sleepers. That's the little catch point from the private colliery sidings out to the um, uh, out to the main line. One of the um, unforeseen advantages that uh, or, or benefits that i've got from having rebuilt the colliery was that the track work at the back there that you can see that's all ballasted and finished that's rail soldered directly to pcb with no chair plates or anything that was some of the first track i made donkeys years ago uh, and i didn't use chair plates then because i didn't bother and actually on there as well uh, the law of averages says that about half the rail will be upside down because I didn't know bullet had a top and a bottom back then. I just soldered it up. It's worked and done the job over the years and, and looks good. But one of the, the, the added benefits now is with having the, the new exchange sidings and the new main line across the front, all done in proper chaired bullhead, is that there's a, a distinct contrast between the two. And the, the stuff at the back that's just laid straight onto the sleepers looks like a lighter section of rail and sort of, you know, buried in ballast that's that, that really isn't maintained to anything like mainline standards so the contrast scenically between the two works really well um, but that's one of those sort of accidents accidental benefits you can, you can see a, a, a little box of um, dog treats down through the gap there on the side they're constant companion in the in the workshop for the dogs keep them happy oh here we are. this is going across the, the track joint between the the fixed part of the layer and the colliery which still goes out occasionally and did i use oh i did use that's some of the easy track brass on some of them i've used pcb and on some i use the the, the easy track uh, cast brass and exactly the same as mick i just glue the whole lot up solid solder it to the sleepers and then gap them i just go in there with a, a slitting disc once it's all dry and, and pop a little bit of filler in the gap I haven't got a picture, but on some of the other track joints uh, elsewhere on, on the layout, I've actually got some thicker PCB uh, with my little Proxon mill that I was bought for a significant birthday a few years ago. I've milled out some track base, which I use across the track joint, which again gives a really nice solid joint. But th that, that system there works, works really well with the cast brass easy track bases. There's the, the colliery again uh, with the extension underway. And I really included that again because you've got that juxtaposition of PCB for the point work and easy track in between. And you can see the change in colour how I've used the two. The big white lump on the on the right is the, the, the batch, the spoil heap, which um, I gave a, a, a talk to the Missenden um, group um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, on the colliery came up on that and um, I did point out that the batch really in terms of spoil heap didn't much more than a pimple 
it should be probably four or five times the height that it is at least. But, you know, even big spoil heaps have to start small somewhere. Mm. I haven't got room for anything bigger. Um, but that's the, the new track work pretty much done by the look of it on there when I took that snap. Um, I'm not sure what's what's going on next, probably wiring up or whatever. That's the stretch where you saw the bendy stick earlier with the track all now in place. The colliery is just off scene to the left of that tree. You can see in the bottom left hand corner and up in right up in the far corner up there is the entrance to Coombe Down Tunnel and that's Tucking Mill Viaduct. Those muddy fields will become green when I eventually get round to putting some ground cover on them. But at the moment, they're still odd rock covered in a gungy gray, uh, brown paint. Nice and tidy underneath. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I've been doing scenic. Scenic work seems to take up, just make a complete mess of your bench. You know, you've got, you've got various pots of watercolour paints and poster paints down there and PVA glue and things. And yeah, the, the bench is full and I should have cleared the bench before I took the snap. But, um, <laughs> but that's, that's that same stretch. That's the, that's the area in front of the colliery now with that easy track all ballasted um, and the point work all laid in. And you can just see in the far distance to the left of that pine tree, uh, you can see Coombe Down Tunnel, I'm just way off in the distance. Start my bit, is it? Oh, right. okay. But that's. Mm. Uh, need to get hold of Craig. Strange. And I think looks got, nice. Uh, thank you. And that's. I think that's it. So as I as I say, uh, my methods are, are very much more old school in that I I use um, wallpaper and bendy stick to to draw out my track plans. The point work, I still use PCB and, and the old-fashioned type of chair plates with the easy track for the plain track. And as, I think, as the others have said, it, it's not because I think the method's any better than any other. It's just what I've always done. And I'm a bit of a stickler like that. I kind of stick to what I know. Um, I've also got a good supply of point work PCB sleeper in in and chair plates and that, so I, I shall continue to, to do them. But uh, it, it, it's hopefully it's useful there as a as an alternate method. Mm. There you go. Thanks very much, Jerry. Um, that, Thanks, Jerry. A, a nice, interesting, different slant and looking at different aspects of it. Yeah, Alan. Yeah, I was just sort of one for Jerry there. Uh, presumably, just uh, just the colliery part is uh, the one that will come out onto the uh, exhibition circuits. And the remainder with the viaduct up and all the rest of it, that's all fixed, is it? Yeah, the, the colliery's going to come out, it's, it's coming to York next year now, 22. Oh, and my God. thinking at the moment is that that will probably be the last time the colliery comes out because <laughs> I, I took it out as hybrid colliery. It did oh, about 70 shows over about 12 or 13 years. And I wasn't going to take it out anymore, but I was asked to take it to Holland. Once I'd, I'd pretty much finished rebuilding it, so I, I made a, an extra fiddle yard for the other end and, and a, a sort of a, an extension piece for the back scene so that it could still go out. And it, it's been out probably half a dozen or so times we took it to RailX and a couple of other places. It works very well taking it out, but it's, it's a big old lump now because it's, it's about six inches longer either end and about nine inches deeper. Than it used to be so although it still it does fit in the back of the car just it's a it's quite a lump to take out along with the the fiddle yard either end and so on and it's slightly awkward to operate in that you've just got a sector plate at either end so to parade trains across the front you've got to keep turning it trains around and putting engines back on which ideally something like this you'd have with a roundy roundy it would be much more straightforward. So I am going to take the colliery out at least once more to York, but that will probably be it. Uh, yes, you're right. The, the, the other section with the viaduct and um, I'm sat underneath the viaduct now at the bench, the viaduct and Coombe Down Tunnel and that whole section is permanent. That won't, that won't go out. That's, that all stands on short legs uh, on brackets off the wall and on the, on the bench um, and the work units underneath it. 
Bath on the other side of the room, I always resisted saying, no, there's no way that's going to go out because um, that's in big six foot six by two foot six lumps. Kim has always been really keen. Oh. I've been very reluctant. Right. Uh, but uh, there's talk that I may uh, try and make it so that, that may come out once or twice, but not. it certainly wouldn't be very often. We'll see. We'll see. Um, but I have got plans, Alan, for another couple of potential small layouts that fit my sort of four foot six by two foot footprint um, for exhibition layouts. I enjoy exhibiting, but I, I, I couldn't go out with huge great layouts because that would drive me balmy. <laughs> you know, I want, I want something I can pack up in under half an hour and be on, in the car and on the road. I mean, I know I've, I've exhibited alongside fence houses a couple of times and, um, you know, we're, we're going around saying our goodbyes and on our way and, and the fence houses lot are still, you know, starting to take stock off and things. I'm a so, great believer in the sharp exit, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I really enjoy exhibiting. I really enjoy the social side of things, but I want to be on the road or at least packed up in half an hour or so that'll do me so i like the layout to be in one lump and maybe a, a couple of small fiddle yards or sector plates or turntables or whatever that i can take off easily so whilst the quarry as i say will go out at least once maybe a couple of times more it won't be a lot because it's been rebuilt to become part of the home layout uh, so that's the reason it's it was rebuilt and and taking it out to a couple of shows is kind of been, it wasn't planned. So, yeah. Right, track work. I don't know whether many people are familiar now with Bill Blackburn's system with multiple layers or, I can't remember how many layers there were now to fabricate chairs. I did try that briefly myself. And at the time I thought it shows promise but you'd have to be much more masochistic than even I am to, to do it. There's a, a lad in the association, Keith Gloucester, who I'm sure it was Mick and I went down to, whether it was Kent or wherever, a few Swanley, years Swanley, Bob. It, it was Swanley. 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 And if memory serves, Keith Gloucester had his layout there which was, I don't know, 10, 12 foot uh, circular layout, all done with Blackburn system. Uh, absolutely amazing. Anyway, later on, I was working for Pete Waterman and in the process using, for seven mil loco frames, we were using 0.7 mil thick nickel silver. And there was a bit of spare space on one day and Edward Sisling suggested a much simpler chair. Basically just do a little chair outline, half etch a slot in the middle and let the rail sit in there. I mean, these, these are just my drawings. The white line is the, the little slot. Outside of that, there was an area and then another half etched area at the outside again, giving the impression of a chair in the middle. I tried that and it worked. I was, I was quite happy with it. You'll see later on, it's not, it's not a patch on easy track, but to get etched chairs, this, this was a good way to go. Now the black framework up here, was made to suit the association jig. The little white holes, the four holes, when you buy the jig, you get four pins. So I made a hole in the etch fret so that these could be pinned in. Now, if you look at the drawing there, the sleepers are laid out at two foot six centers. The numbered, which is quite important, you basically cut your sleepers to length off the drawing, place them in there, then you lay the etch over the top. The etch is compressed. The little red strips, I can't remember how wide these are now, probably not much more than half a millimetre. So the white areas where your sleepers go and the etch was made 
to match. Basically, on the rear side of the etch, a blob of solder on each individual chair. Some people used a normal soldering iron with the chisel end filed down so it would fit in these half mil gaps in the chair. So you just press down with your soldering iron that melted the solder onto the sleepers which are in position. So you can see up here the slide chairs and what have you all replicated on the drawing. I've drawn in rails and everything else. So it was important once you started cutting these etches off, once they were soldered to the sleepers, it was important to keep the, the order in which they were laid out. That's all taken care of in the instructions. And as I say, the use was made of the, the jigs. That's a straightforward, I think I settled on B8, sorry, that's a B7. That was probably three foot radius. I did the B8s, I think, the four foot radius. Right. If you can imagine a train coming off Victoria, it would come from the left on the up main line and straight through towards Pensher. All of the blue and even these top sleepers, this is the bit that runs off the baseboard that is the Sunderland branch so all of this lot up the top and part way down here this is all non-electrical the only bit that's electrified is the up main coming from left to right through here and then the down main going right to left through there towards Victoria so how do I get all of this lot drawn on curves and angles? In order to fit the association jigs, every sleeper has to be vertical. Some of these numbers disappeared. That, that is just a technical thing on the way I've drawn them out. They're actual, they are actually all numbered, but some of the numbers have disappeared. From there, I had to split it up using the same jig each time I had to split it up the blue refers to the blue sleepers and the grey is a separate thing basically the same as this but using the different sleepers now it looks weird you can see the sleepers there all of this lot and all looks a bit cranky it's simply because the sleepers the spacing has been compressed to fit into the jig so all of that resulted in this. This is going off the baseboard towards Sunderland. Pensure loops are here and the down main coming from the top to the bottom towards Victoria. Hell of a lot of work and these aren't actually, the, the blades are soldered so even if something tried to get through it might run through for a lot of it but it's not electrified anyway the only two as I say these two lines are there they're electrified the next one is what we've just seen it was up on the black here to the left the next is the pension loops the green is the up main and the gray is the down main so again same idea all drawn out everything prepared for the jigs and resulting in that just a little bit later you can see the the shiny tops of the pips which represent the chairs from a distance you know it's it's fine this is the same formation on the baseboard if anybody's wondering what this wagon is down here that was a commission for a Great Northern 50 ton brick wagon. This is Pensha South, which is the opposite end. This is the head shunt, which finishes at Wapping Bridge. That are the same thing. Some of these circles, I used all sorts of things just to help space things out. This is the formation in place. 
And for the observant, this down the bottom here is the very first piece of easy track. I can't remember exactly where I started. I did, get, I did do quite a lot of um, fiddle yard track work first and then came over Victoria and then along here. But this, this board is where the colliery is situated over to the right and that's the first bit of easy track. I'm only guessing but easy track must have saved us two maybe even three years who knows but thanks to Mick and his brave band of warriors getting it moving saved years anyway the same south end of Pentia is the end of the four track system that's the start of it up there and then round the bend to Victoria. In the station area, the, the easy track and the soldered formation can easily be seen. I've never, never ever figured out how I did it, but this diamond crossing here should have been there where the slip is and vice versa. Not many people knew that, what they do now. This bit here with the tubing for the control, that's all under scenic work and the back scene stops people seeing the, uh, the servos. Because of the complexity of the track, there's so many close controls, I didn't think we'd be able to get these servos underneath, so that was one of the main reasons why we went for the servos on the top. If I zoom in, obviously the forefront, you can see the chairs quite clearly and the pips of the X chairs, as I say, from a distance, again, the same here, all the turnouts are the soldered construction, jumping onto the easy track which is, you can see it on blown up photographs like this. Amazing stuff and time saving, unbelievable. The date of this photo is the 4th of June, 2010. That was the first time the whole layout was set up for public exhibition at the, the Oxford venue. And again, the easy track the pips of the soldered track jumping onto the, the easy track. So this is the second single slip. They, they work quite well. I was quite bothered about derailments and what have you, but I think the only time we've had any consecutive derailments, the aforementioned Keith Gloucester building one of his two 9F kits that he bought off me, he put side springing on the, uh, the pony truck on the 9F and it kept derailing on the, not this, because this is the colliery line, but the other end of the layout, the diamond crossing in Pensha Loop, whereas my 9F isn't sprung and I don't think I've ever had any derailment with it. And people seeing fence houses originally might remember the two tracks down at the bottom, the two lines, those were the only two that went round. Later on, John needed more shunting area for this colliery stuff. Started, added more lines, crossovers, and even put a gradient into the left here, leading up to the, the main level of the layout, which is about 35 millimetres higher than this lower level. Talk about cramming a quart into a pint pot. You can get through here with short wheelbase bogies used on the Class 24s and I did amend the rear pony trucks on my two Lampton tanks. They do go round but it's quite a side spring. And that's it. Mm. So unless anybody's got any questions. Yeah Bob, um, I wanted to ask how do you, do you lay your track on like a template diagram or something first off the bench, I guess, and then you transfer it onto the board. Is that how you do it or? Uh, initially, 
And Les did a load of templots. How many sheets, Les? Can you remember? A4 sheets, was it? I, I can't remember, but I did the whole of the scenic section in template. And there, there was a, a problem with it in that I was overlaying it or trying to overlay it on the background shape of the uh, national grid plan that Bob had had scanned. And on that plan, I don't know whether it was actually like this in real life or whether it was some sort of aberration with the drawing. There was a slight curve, very slight curve. And the Templar over that length couldn't replicate that. Modeler's mm. license then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, th I think there are ways now with the current Templar where you mm. can import a, a map and you can stretch it, compress it, section it, and curve it to almost anything you want. It's a bit of work, and the more variation in the curves and compression you have along a plan, obviously, the more repetitious it is. I've not done that, but um, and it is a facility on there if you want to embark on a learning curve to do it. What, what I did using Les's A4 sheet printouts, I spliced them together where necessary. The likes of this junction starting at the top left, uh, the double junction coming through. Anyway, this lot, I don't know what the length is, probably well, it must be over, over two foot, it was all done in one piece over the, the template drawings. The sleepers were glued on, I think Mick mentioned it the other week with Pritt stick. And the, the template drawings weren't glued down. I, sell it, I made them wider and sellotaped them over the edge, obviously not where the sleepers go. It wasn't as big as Jerry's sheet of wallpaper. Um, mm. It was the, the A4 cutouts placed on a board not not actually on the, the layout board. They were just placed on any board that was big enough. The whole thing was built, strip off the cellar tape on the edging, lifting the whole thing up and just laid in a bath and left for 20 minutes, whatever it took. And you found that the print stick just disintegrated and the backing paper came off. The whole thing was lifted up once it was dry, I used just normal PVA wood glue for gluing all the sleepers down. Not for the easy track, because that's got its own glue. Uh, for all the soldered stuff with the uh, PCB sleepers, lots of different weights. And it, that, that was fairly easy to do. I, it wasn't really difficult, but you can see slight curves in the easy track. All of these, because the glue obviously wasn't instantaneous, once I'd laid it, I had weights on it. I'd give it a five, ten minutes, lift the weight off and have a look. If it had moved, I'd tweak it back again. And it, it was a bit of a constant backwards and forwards. But it did all work in the end and very well. Mm -hmm. And of course, as we've said before, Mick and I had a couple of conversations about matching the two systems and it, it did work perfectly. All the fiddle yard track work is simply plain strip rail soldered direct to the sleepers and a transition of somewhere between I don't know two inches two and a half inches in length all I did was stop soldering about two inches from the end of the soldered track joined it to the easy track and then just added solder in the gap because of the height difference. And we've never had a derailment. It just gently falls down or rises up, whichever way you look at it. And the rail's just secured with more solder. Mm. Do you have to mark like centre lines on the actual baseboard, yep. Bob? To, well, so you had, had all centre lines marked in pencil or something and then you after you'd soaked the paper template off the track you lined them up on the center line yes. something like that yes. some of the areas steve i, I drew two lines uh, you can get away with the center line 
if your eye's good, just for laying the sleepers, it does help if you've got two lines because it's easy sometimes to wander off, especially if you're laying sleepers. I did find in one or two areas, I was right on the edge of a sleeper and a great big spare bit on the other side. I think that was only in the fiddle yard though. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. One thing I've, I've since found, I, I, what I've not liked about Templot really, is printing them out on sheets and sticking them together with sellotape. That's always bugged me because I thought there's a lot of possibilities of getting errors into things. And I found a company, and I think it's Penrith, who print out on a continuous roll. And I've used them a few times, and they're very good. And, and yes. not that expensive, but it does sort of get rid of that yeah. sort of possibility of error. Um, yeah. How, how does that work, Les? Do they have to have template at their end, or is it something you send them? Well, I, I just sent them the drawing, and they also wanted some squares on the template plane so they could uh, get the size correct. And I think I'll use something like, oh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but probably about 50 millimetre squares or grid I put on or something like that. Right. And then they could measure that there in to make sure they had the scaling right for the printing. They were very good and supportive. I used them a few times for my stuff, you know, and uh, I, I do I do prefer it than sticking A4 sheets together, personally. I did that. I got my entire second board printed in one sheet on a continuous printer. It wasn't hard. I just gave them a file and they plonked it in and printed yeah. it out. And I checked the scale with a vernier. I knew some known track gaps and it was spot on. Mm -hmm. Would that be a DXF file? Not that I understand these things, but uh, is that the file they use? I think it was I a think DXF it was a, I used. Might have been a PDF. Yeah. No, I don't think it was in my case. I think it was a DXF because we got into the debate about what level of software I had and what they had. But it doesn't matter. I mean, most printers will probably have their own preferences anyway. And the words mm. of what they want, you know. Isn't isn't the point that the DXF file is essentially dimensionless, so that you know it's not without a scale. So that's why you need the scale squares and what have you. Whereas a PDF file, the scale should be set. And you know, as long as it's printed as provided, then a D then a PDF should be fine. Whereas a DXF, you need to set the. Yeah, that's probably why I had to put the background grid on for them so they could measure off it. They asked for that, and I gave them it. You know. With my yeah, just check the mine with PDFs. Yeah, so that make it easier. Yeah. yeah. With, with my etchings, I put a scale bar on the artwork and they ask for a PDF as well so that they can see what the artwork is supposed to be. Sometimes when you send artwork over the web, it distorts. I, I didn't realise for quite a while any printing of letters most of the time it worked fine, but sometimes I was getting stuff back and it looked like Greek or hieroglyphics and the, com the computers didn't talk properly to each other. But there's the facility in the text, it's called Create Outlines on the drawing program I use. And it breaks down a drawn letter into vector points so the computer can read it exactly. Um, so it must be something similar to the, the printing. Mm. But anyway, we got there in the end, thanks to the Les and Templot. And mm. uh, some of it was a bit of a finger in the air, hope it all fits type of thing. But <laughs> <laughs> we got there in the end on my side anyway. Mm. Thank, that's really good. Thank you.